Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. In today's episode, I welcome CEO of Fuel to Fire, Midori. And in our discussion, Midori schools me on the zone of genius. What is the zone of genius? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? If you are like me and been living under a rock for the past two days producing a podcast from your basement, then Zone of Genius may be a new phrase for you as well. The Zone of Genius was coined back in 2009, I believe, when Gay Hendrickson wrote the book The Big Leap and laid out the framework of creating harmony between jobs and people. I have recently purchased and am reading through The Big Leap and plan to read The Zone of Genius thereafter. The book describes how to optimize oneself and others in specific roles to maximize performance and overall enjoyment. And it comes down to asking three questions. What does the entrepreneur want? What is the entrepreneur good at? And what need is being solved to achieve this goal? Now, again, I'm just reading about this. However, I read the manager's handbook by Alex McCall that describes the four zones pretty well. Zone of incompetence, zone of competence, zone of excellence, and then zone of genius. First, zone of incompetence. In this zone, the most obvious misalignment between people and tasks is where there is a lack of talent or skills, according to McCall. In this case, the person should either be retrained, redistributed in the organization, meaning placed in a new role, or asked to find a better match outside the company, said McCall. And this makes sense. I was taught there are three types of employees. Engaged employees, someone that comes to work every day, enjoys their job, and has a sense of fulfillment in what they are doing. Then there's the RIP employee. This is an individual who is retired in place. They come do the bare minimum, but they do not cause any trouble. They get their payment and they just go home. Lastly, there is the cave employee. Constantly against virtually everything employees who really are disengaged and truly do not enjoy their role, organization, or colleagues. Now, I do not generalize staff constantly into these categories, and these are not meant to be derogatory. This is simply how an entrepreneur can view staff and how staff can view themselves. I like retired in place employees because I know I can get them to being engaged by finding a role within the organization that aligns with their skill set. I was an RIP employee for years. I sat at work and did crosswords every day. It wasn't until my direct manager sought a role that she knew aligned with my goals and skill set that I became an engaged employee, and the rest is history. However, a cave employee can actually bring down the entire culture in an organization because they are constantly against virtually everything. I hate the drive to work, the brand, the CEO, the color, the logo, and they are entitled to tell everyone they know exactly how they feel. It is okay to help them find roles outside of the organization, and it is okay to seek other roles outside of organizations you currently work in. Remember, you can work in an organization and still be an entrepreneur. McCraw continues to describe the zone of competence. These are tasks that people are good at, but other people can do better. Work that falls under this category should be delegated or redistributed to people more suited for it. I feel I'm a pretty good talker. I can spark up a relationship pretty well, so I'm tasked to build community relationships. I'm tapping into my zone of competence, but that doesn't make me an excellent speaker or an expert, I'm simply tapping into my zone of competence. McCall continues, zone of excellence. It is less clear when someone is talented and skilled in a particular area, but the work doesn't give them energy. They may be successful in short term, but over time they will burn out. We call this the zone of excellence. It's important to recognize when people are in this, or even better if they can recognize it, so you can do something about it. In this case, I think of an artist or a scratch golfer for my sports junkies, someone that is simply gifted with a unique talent. Although someone may be a talented painter, sculpturing may be their desired profession. Lastly, McCall states, the zone of genius. When all talent, skills, and strengths are aligned, 
we are in our zone of genius. The things in your zone of genius are the things that you are uniquely good at in the world and that you love to do so much so that time and space likely disappear when you do them. This is where you can add the most value to the world and yourself. This is where you should be driving towards spending most, if not all, of your time. The same goes for your team. They are operating their best when they are operating out of their zone of genius. Listen, I have no clue what my zone of genius is, and that is okay. In fact, my next guest, CEO from Fuel to Fire, Midori, is here to help find that inner genius with accountability groups for seasoned entrepreneurs and leaders. Because at the end of the day, we're just one entrepreneur in a community of entrepreneurs. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Midori. How are we doing? We're doing great. I'm excited because we've been chatting. We've been chatting already, so we've been already talking, but... Before we get into everything, we're going to talk about Fuel to Fire uh, later on. But before we get into that, let's give them an introduction. Who is Midori? Yeah, I'm a just a crazy <laughs> serial entrepreneur. I've, you know, I've, I've been owning businesses right out of college. So it's been, uh, not to age myself, but too late, um, over 25 <laughs> years. And uh, it's in my DNA. I, I love business. I'm not good at anything else, Gabriel. I'm just good at business. And so um, luckily I found that niche early on, but that's, that's who I am. I've owned several businesses over the years, um, worked with startups to Fortune 500s, um, had, you know, had, have a lot of bruises and scraped up knees from entrepreneurship, but also have some pretty big wins. So that, that's who I am. Nice. So you're one of those people that went to college when you're like 10 years old, huh? That's right. Yeah. Yes. Super genius. <laughs> yes. You, you got it. <laughs> Nailed it. So uh-huh. where, where, where did you go to school? At UC Davis. Nice. In California. Yeah. yeah. I, UC Davis, not too far from good old Portland, Oregon. So let's, let's talk about Fuel to Fire. What is Fuel to Fire? Fuel the Fire is an accountability group um, for highly driven people, entrepreneurs, who want to accelerate their goals. We work a lot with women. We also have groups for men. But really what it is that I've seen, Gabriel, is that there are similar issues that I see for entrepreneurs. Losing the focus on their big fat goals and then also feeling like they're alone on their own island. Right. And so that's where I came in. And um, the fuel the fire system is just really, really simple uh, because we're busy. You know, as entrepreneurs, we're busy and we want that support and we want to have our, our questions answered right now um, so we can keep on moving forward. So that's really kind of the crux of fuel the fire. You know, one of the things you mentioned, uh, I hear pretty consistently on this podcast is that sense of loneliness. That mm-hmm. feeling like you are on the island by, and I, I must admit, you know, I'm down in my basement, you know, cracking away at this small business or trying to create, and it does feel, lo- how, what, what advice do you give individuals that do feel that? Yeah. I mean, think of times when maybe you're in high school or in college, right? And there's a big project that was due 
And then you got together with your, with your classmates who are pretty intelligent too, you know, and, and focused and how much faster you are able to come up with ideas and get creative and solve problems and get things done. Right. And so as entrepreneurs, you know, we're buyers, especially now, so many of us are working from home. But that's a huge part of it is to find an accountability group, at least an accountability partner who is at your level or higher. So not your mom, not your bestie, but someone who understands what you're talking about, who is invested in it and speaks your language. Really, that's, that is what I have seen be a huge accelerator for entrepreneurs. You know, I, I, I agree with that. In fact, you know, one of the things I try to hammer home is the importance of networking. How important, how, how would you say important networking is? Oh my gosh, it's, it's huge. And I didn't realize how important it was, but it, okay. So let me just back up for a minute. So one thing that I talk about quite a bit is knowing your zone of genius. So when I say zone of genius, that for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, it means what are you really good at and what do you love doing? So some people are really good at networking. Other people, that scares the crud out of them. And if they, you put them in that situation, they're going to go hide in the corner and then go home and feel embarrassed. And so it doesn't work. So when you ask me how important is networking, if you are the personality style that um, can converse really well, I have a client named Lene, and she is such a natural at networking. And so we've been looking at all these different um, types of marketing for her. And I said, you know, Lene, you just kill it when you go and you network. Let's amplify that. Let's find you some groups. So really to answer your question, I would say it depends on what you're really good at and what Mm -hmm. comes naturally. I like that answer. I think that's a, that's a big point too. You know, we, we can be the jack of all trades, right? And I can teach you how to be like good customer service. I, you know, like, customer service tends to be my bread and butter, right? I can, I can teach you how to be a good customer service, but I can't teach you to be a people person. You know, that, 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 that's hard. That piece that you just, you are not right. Yeah. But I do think, I mean, I have seen this so many times, even if you're an introvert, I've seen introverts go from the person that's hiding in the corner to being that person who can get out in front and they shine. They have to go home and sleep afterwards, (laughs) but you know, you can, if, if you really know that there's going to be a lot of value for you in networking, you can get better. Yeah. So I like it. Now, now when was, when was fuel to fire established? It's a new company. This was um, during the pandemic 20, 2020. So we've been in around for 18 months wow. as of this recording. Mm-hmm. What has been kind of difficult about starting, a, especially during a pandemic? Um, you know, just growing, really growing. Because for me, I am, I do enjoy networking. I do enjoy getting out there. So luckily um, I've been I've been working with entrepreneurs for a while. So I had an email list um, and then referrals has been good, but that would be the hardest part is really just getting the word out there in person so they can see who I am um, and going from there. And what, why, why did you feel like you wanted to create this company? Cause you mentioned you've been a serial entrepreneur for 25 years. Why did you decide, you know, now's the time to create this? Yeah. For the same reason, pandemic, you know, I saw, so many people, so many entrepreneurs when the pandemic hit that just kind of froze. They didn't know what to do. Their whole world got turned upside down and they were frightened, rightfully so. But when you've been an entrepreneur for as long as I have, you're so used to getting punched in the gut, knocked out at the knees that you just learned to rebound a lot quicker. Um, And so one thing that I have learned from doing this for so many years is to look for opportunities and stay focused on what my zone of genius is. And also, you know, what am I passionate about? What do I love? And I love helping entrepreneurs. So that's really what fueled, not to use the word redundantly, but that's what <laughs> fueled, fueled a fire was I saw a need. I knew that I could help these entrepreneurs. And, um, and that's, that's really the impetus for starting. So how did you create it? How did, did you go like grassroots efforts financing? Did you go like venture capital? How did you end up kind of creating the company? Yeah. So totally out of pocket. Um, 
the nice thing about fuel the fire it wasn't a, a huge overhead really where the the main asset is not to sound egotistical but it's me you know it's i'm the one who put it together but it's the concept behind it so it's the entrepreneurial small pods that we have and then the summit goal mapping system which i've been using for years i didn't have a name for it but the problem with entrepreneurs is we go into business because we have big goals, right? We're excited. We want to do these, these incredible things and create a certain type of lifestyle. But along the way, we're so busy putting out fires and going after different things that we get sidetracked. So by having what we call the summit goal mapping framework, it acts as your blueprint on how to get to where you want to go and stay focused. And then you layer that with the accountability groups and that's your one, two punch. So, um, anyway, that's, that's kind of, you know, how, how it's all worked, but those, those are the main assets behind Feel the Fire. Nice. Now let's, let's take it back 25 years, you know, cause you, you're, you're right. And you're not being egotistical, but these individuals are kind of paying for your 25 years of experience in entrepreneurism, right? Let's take it back. What was your first, what was your first company? Yeah, it was an event business where we did rentals. And um, we financed that with credit cards. So if you're talking about financing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah let's, get, let's get back back in the day. I don't yeah, know we, the good stuff. We had no credit. You know, my husband and I, we got married just straight out of college. We met in college and then we got mar- married right after. And we're like, and we were in a recession at that time. So like, what should we do? Let's start a business. <laughs> and we had nothing to lose. We had no assets. And so I had a little room on my credit card. And so that's where we started. And that's when Google AdWords had just come out. Probably about two years into our business. So we were in the yellow pages paying out the nose for that. And then um, I was one of the early adopters of Google AdWords. And then our business just took off from that. Um, but yeah, so that's. What, were, what we were some of the biggest things you learned from that first one? Um, systems. You need systems. And when you think that your business is so unique that that um, general princi- business principles won't apply to you, I would invite you to rethink that. Um, and so once I learned about frameworks and systems and how to keep on imp- improving those, that's when things really started to change because I could put people in the place to take over things that I was doing. And that's, you know, obviously that's been something that's been going on. Um, And then finding someone who can help you. Those were big things. So when I talk about systems, I went through the whole E-Myth program. So for those who are new to business or um, wanting to learn systems, Get the E-Myth book by Michael E. Gerber. That's a good start place. I went, I did go through the program, um, but he's kind of the godfather of small business. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm writing this one down. So you, you can keep talking. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I can talk forever. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of where I started. The, um, and, you know, some of the other challenges is one thing that I see with so many of my clients is they're afraid to hire. They're afraid oh, yeah. to make that first hire. Yeah. yeah. And I'll tell you, if I didn't hire, you and I probably wouldn't be talking right now because my business would be so small. Um, so kind of the other part that I work with my clients quite a bit on is mindset. What kind of mindset do you have? Do you have a mindset for abundance or do you have a scarcity mindset? If you have a scarcity mindset, it's going to be very hard for you to grow your business and be successful. So really working on you know, your neuro, neuroplasticity and creating a growth mindset. And what do you need to do to grow your business? Who do you need? Because I guarantee it's not just you. Who, who fills your weaknesses? Um, who can you delegate to, to help you move forward quicker? You know, that's, that's a big point too. Cause I think uh, a lot of folks, one, the systems that you mentioned, you know, I think, creating some type of structure around your operational is is very important because if you're sick or out for a day, you can't do everything right. And you have to be able to have somebody be able to kind of walk in right then and there and know exactly what you're doing. And documentation is a lot of things. Like I have spreadsheets in front of me of just like, okay, after this interview, this is what I do after the interview and after the interview, after I do like step-by-step, right. It kind of takes me. So even if I'm not here and if somebody decides to become the host of the show, 
they have now a process to kind of follow, you know, that, and I think that's so, so important. Now, what did you do after that? You, you were kind of mentioning, right, your first job, mm-hmm. you're starting to grow. What, did you sell it? Did you, what, what'd you end up doing? How'd you move on to the <laughs> next one? We still own it. Oh, we really? still have it. Yeah. And the beauty of that, when I talk about systems and hiring is that I don't do anything with it anymore. Oh, so, so nice. yeah. And we're going to Europe. Um, we're leaving this, this coming Monday, we're going for three weeks. Um, and so that's why it's so powerful to have these systems. And let me just give you, give an example so oh, people please. can yeah. see this. Yeah. So one of my clients, um, she is, she has a triathlon company. She's a, co- she's a fitness coach and she has a triathlon company. And when she came into fuel, the fire, she told me, she's like, I want to grow this so that I don't have to do everything anymore. And that I have a team in place so that I can go do the things that I'm really good at and that I want to do. I'm like, okay, great. Let's put this into a framework. So at that point, she had never had an employee. And so we used the summit goal mapping framework. You know, we keep it really, really simple. None of this is complicated, but as long as you follow the system, you're going to hit your goals. So we knew that her big objective, which we call summit goals. So that's the very top, you know, those are 12 months to two years out was that she wanted to have a full team in place so that she could go and do what she wanted to do. Then we just go down to what we call approach goals. Those are your quarterly or 90 day goals. So when you think of approach, think you're approaching that summit, that top part, right? So you just chunk it down into 90 day goals. What needs to happen this quarter to get you closer to there? So that's one of the quarters she focused on systems and that's all she, you know, she just really zoned in on creating strong systems. Next quarter, she, she had people in place for hiring, but then she started training the leaders. So those leaders could then supervise the people beneath beneath them. And that takes her out of the equation. Fast forward, she is six months ahead of her big summit goals. She has now scaled into other states and she has a full team in place. That is how you grow a business. And it wasn't, it's, you know, it it sounds so simple, but all she did was she had the roadmap for it and she followed it. She stayed focused on it and she followed it. You know, I I think one thing I've never highlighted very much is like the importance of planning, like strategic planning, like quarterly goals, biannual goals, annual goals, right? Five-year goals. Why, why did you kind of, how did you first and foremost, cause you, this is kind of your system that you kind of created. how one, did you, how'd you kind of create this? And then two, why do you feel planning is so important? Without a plan, you're kind of running blind, right? That's a, the biggest thing that I see for clients is that they're running around all the time. We talked about a second ago that, you know, they're, they're putting out fires constantly. There's a lot of demands on an entrepreneur, especially a small entrepreneur, And so if you don't have a plan and if you don't have consistent accountability, someone that you're answering to, to keep you focused on that, to make you find a way to find a way to get those goals done, it's going to take you a lot longer. Not that you won't, but it's just going to take you a lot longer. So these systems that I have in place are from (laughs) trials and errors, right? You know, from owning businesses for so long, I found ways to make it a lot easier and more enjoyable to achieve the things that I wanted to achieve. And so that's really where it comes from. You know, folks, I hope you guys are taking notes because this is just like free knowledge that's being dropped on y'all right now. And I know you actually have a a system that folks, please, uh, again, we'll have the information on the newsletter. So please subscribe to the newsletter. But again, this is really information from a seasoned entrepreneur that's really trying to provide some insight on how this individual has become successful. This is the roadmap they use. Now, again, there's many roadmaps out there and some of them might be for you and some of them might not be for you. But again, right now, this podcast is free for everybody. Just want to let you know, this is some free education. Now, you, you, you mentioned how, how you created it and how you established Field of Fire. Um, now, what was, you, you mentioned kind of what the, the hardest part about getting it started, you know, especially during the pandemic, but what has been easy about kind of, you, you've done a lot of other entrepreneurial work what has been kind of easy about this one or has there been anything easy about field of fire? Yeah, I think when I started this, you know, it was, it was based on what I really wanted in life. You know, I'm, I'm at a stage now where I, I can, I can create a business that is completely in alignment with what matters to me the most. And that's what fuel the fire embodies. And so the part that 
I, I don't know that I'd say it's the easiest, but it's the part that I enjoy the most. It's the part that makes me want to jump out of bed every morning is being able to work with the clients, you know, working with the members um, and seeing their growth and being able to help bounce ideas. Uh, you know, I might not have all the answers, but I can probably lead you towards the right answer. Um, and just, you know, I get fueled up by, by what they're accomplishing and what they're doing because it's working. And so that's, that feels pretty darn good. Um, so I, that's what I would say. I don't know that I'd say it's the easiest, but it would be the thing that I love the most. And what what would you consider, what is your typical client? So folks that are listening right now, who would who is like folks you, you work with? So we have two tiers. We have our Ignited group, which is for businesses that are bringing in under a million dollars in revenue per year. And then we have our Sparked. And that is for entrepreneurs that are bringing over that. There's just different, different conversations for those two different groups. Um, and so that's who our clientele is right now is those two groups. The ignited is primarily women entrepreneurs. The sparked, we have quite a few men in there too. Gotcha. Now, how do you define entrepreneurs? Do you also allow, you know, CEO executives that maybe are part of a small business to join, or is it primary like, you know, founders and or how do you, how do you define it? Yeah, that's a good question. So yes, we do have we do have um, CEOs and executives that are in Fuel the Fire. They need to be someone who can give back to their group, right? So that's what we screen every single person who comes in. So as long as they have some kind of amazing skill, we brought someone in this quarter who is great at partnerships. She has a lot of skills in partnerships. I'm like, oh my gosh, she'll be so valuable in Fuel the Fire and we can help you too. And so she's part of it. So we just need to make sure that there is, um, there's value for everyone that's involved. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how we monitor that. You know, that's, I feel like that's the key to any business is find a way to provide value. People will pay for value, right? Whatever is valuable to them, they'll pay for it. Now you've been doing, you've done a lot. You've been doing this for 25 years. Now you're starting fuel to fire. What motivates you? You know, again, it's that passion, my core values, it's my zone of genius. And when you can live and play there every day, that's pretty darn good. That's a good feeling. And so, you know, that's usually the first thing that we do with our clients when they come in is we call it the personal mission statement. And so we, we have them write out, figure out what that is. What are those three things that, that move you so much? And then you create a personal mission statement about it. And then, so even if you have a business that's established, you can tweak it and you can tailor it. So it's in alignment with that more. And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what keeps us going. Now you mentioned your, your zone, your, 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 your what is your personal zone? My zone is um, motivating and inspiring entrepreneurs. I can, one thing that I'm really, I've become skilled at, I guess, from doing this for so long, is being able to talk to someone who's in business and being able to see the things that they don't see. For instance, talking about one of my clients who's a college professor, she came to me, she's a PhD. And she said to me, Midori, I'm really not a true entrepreneur. I'm, I'm a professor. I'm like, what do you mean? I said, you have a business. You, you know, she was just starting then. Um, but she's like, yeah, I, you know, I just, at work, I'm a professor, I'm a teacher. And I'm like, wait, we can, we can weave this in. And that's such a huge asset that you're not seeing. You're missing that mark. And so now we have made that part of what she talks about all the time. She has a PhD and she didn't see it because everyone around her had a PhD. Right, yeah. But now we're using that as her lead. You know, that's her zone of genius. So she's been able to get into corporations to be a leadership coach. Um, or, or mentor. And um, she's, she is, she just texted me. She has already four months ahead of time, hit her big summit goals for the year. And she has more people in her groups than she had anticipated. And it's because we just tweaked the things that she already was good at and, you know, made it into something that she could finally see and grasp and put it into her mindset that, oh, okay, I, I, I believe this now and I, I get it. So you know, I think that might be one of the hardest things about your, that concept of zone of genius is for the entrepreneur is determining or coming to the realization what those two are, right? I think that might be the hardest part is determining what is my zone of, I'm thinking to myself, like, 
I like to talk. <laughs> okay, well, let's do an exercise and let's, oh, let's play around here because I think this is fun for everyone listening. Okay, so think of all the things, whether it was when you were in high school or when you were volunteering or in any kind of job that you've had that you loved, that you did it really, really well, or people have told you you're gifted. So you like talking, Gabriel, right? So I'm guessing that um, you you're super outgoing. So you're probably a really good networker. That's probably one of your zone of geniuses right there, right? One of the things that is also important is what are your weaknesses? I'm wondering, how are you at organization? Horrible. I'm, yep. Uh, that's why I get these processes in place. <laughs> yep. So that's usually the, the yin and yang of yep. that, right? That's, that's pretty typical. So knowing your zone of genius is important. So you, you are outgoing, you can walk into a room, um, you can probably host an event pretty well, but to make your business successful, you need an implementer. You need a person who's organized to help you get these systems in place even more or help you execute them more consistently so that you can do what you really love. Stay focused on that. You, you, you love to talk. You love podcasting. You're a natural at it. So you can go play there more because that's really how you're going to create the most revenue for you is focusing on what you're the best at. You know, that's, it's kind of funny you mentioned that because I feel like I'm the yin and my wife is the yang. She is the organizer. She keeps things on track. She doesn't really want to go out and network with many people. She's fine staying at home and, and you know, hanging out. But it's that's very true. Uh, you know, there's there's I can motivate a crowd very well, but uh, organizing a conference, I can probably can't do as well about. You know? Okay, so let's talk about that. So So if you think about what you do, and you want to get more clients in, you want to get spread the word about you. So you know the conference is going to be good for you to host an event, a live event would be really good. If you're spending time trying to organize it, you're wasting your time. What you should be doing is focusing on what, how are you going to deliver your message? How are you going to impact these people through being on stage? What can you do to ignite the people that come? That's your zone. Do you see how that's going to be so much more powerful for you? And then you have someone, whether it's your wife, if you can kind of somehow smooth her or do a deal with her <laughs> to get her to help you with the organization, or you hire someone, a VA or somebody to help you with that part. So can you, I'm hoping that people who are listening are starting to see how, when you focus on what you're really good at and you put more time into that, you're going to love your business more. You're going to accelerate it a gazillion times faster, and you're going to put more money in your pocket. And then also you're not going to have a headache at the end of the day in general, because you're not doing things that you're not good at. Yeah, no, I'm literally right now, my, the, the wheels are spinning in my head. Like, oh yeah, this makes sense. I shouldn't be spending all this time on this, like, you know, looking out for these events and scheduling them and yeah, outsourcing, yeah. outsourcing is a good thing. <laughs> it is. And it might cost you money in the very beginning. Right. And so that's, that's something that, that trips up people sometimes is, oh, but I don't have the money for it yet. If you can put it on a credit card, if you can find the money somewhere and you really plan out, this is where the summit goals come in as well. Where are you going? And if you know that you can get there, then why are you going the slow route to get there? You see what I mean? Yeah. If you can invest in somebody else who's going to help you do the things that you stink at or that you just really don't want to do and you can focus on the things that you're super good at, you're going to get to those revenue goals, those, those personal goals so much faster. So that's another thing that I invite everyone who's listening to think about and yeah. how can you get there quicker? That's a great point. In fact, folks that are listening, a great episode is Bob Thomas, uh, Peak Asset Management. He talks a lot about leveraging debt. I mean, that's that's a great point, you know, leveraging the debt that's available. Now, what keeps you up at night as a small business owner or as an entrepreneur? You're now running two, well, running, you have owned two businesses right now going at the same time. What keeps you up at night? What has kept me up all night, for, or not all night, but, but up at night for the last 18 months is I'm constantly thinking, how can I improve our program? How can I get better results for the clients? And this is one thing that I've found from owning different businesses over the years is when you focus on the outcome for your clients, you're going to have more success, right? And you're going to feel better about your business. And so that's what we've been doing the last 18 months is just really refining things, getting um, I figured out that I needed to have a facilitator in each group. So we got someone and we trained him and, um, and he's training other people now. And so 
that's that's what keeps me up at night. Man, you got you got a lot going on at, at one time. It seems like now. Where do you see Fool to the Fire in the next five years? Oh gosh, our goal is to become the most goal centric, successful company for entrepreneurs in the Western world. Um, and so that's what I see. I see bigger partnerships. I see us getting into corporate um, because it's all the same proprietary systems that we use and that we've proved. Um, so now it's just, six, we're at that stage. We we were in three phases. We finished up phase one where I it kept me up at night trying to improve the program. Now we're in phase two, we're accelerating, we're bringing in more members, we're doing partnerships and then we'll go into corporate next. Nice. Nice. You, you really do. You got the roadmap. I love it. I got the roadmap. Really, this is not that complicated. I, I see, you keep <laughs> yeah. saying it's not that complicated. I mean, everybody's <laughs> listening like, oh, it sounds so complicated. But it's it's nice because I think you're encouraging enough to also like, hey, no, this is how I did it. It worked for me. It's worked for other people. It's a tested and true concept that's working. It makes sense. Now, what is what is some last kind of what's some last nuggets of advice you'd give the listeners? You know, just stick to it. If you want something bad enough, make sure that it's in alignment with your core values and with what drives you and your zone of genius and stay persistent. Get an accountability person for you because it's tough. I don't care how seasoned you are as an entrepreneur. I've been at this for a long, long time. I have an accountability group. I use the summit goals. I use these things that are proven. I don't care how advanced you are in business. It's the, it comes down to the same foundational tools, right? So that's what I suggest. Yeah, build that foundation. I really love it. Now, before we go, how can the folks get a hold of you? Where can they find you on the social website? Give them their information. Yeah, so I, I'm everywhere. Um, but what I would like to share with the clients, we've talked a lot about systems and about goal setting. And so I'm happy to share our goal mapping framework. It's called the Summit Goal Mapping Framework. Um, it has a video training in there as well as the templates. Um, and it's what I use and it's what my clients use. And it's very, very simple. All they have to do is just go to fuel to fire.co forward slash goals. Perfect. Perfect. And folks, I will have that information on the newsletter. So please subscribe to newsletter. We'll also have the information online. You can follow me at the shades of E on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and the TikTok. I have like two videos. I know. I'm sorry. I will do better about the TikTok people. Other than that, thank you so much. Such a, such a great Midori. Awesome conversation. I'm honestly, I'm thinking like my, the hill, the wheels are starting to spin. I'm thinking of like all these goals in my head starting to break down. 2023 is right around the corner, folks. It is not too early to start creating your your goals for the year and then break it down, you know, break it down to the month, break it down to a quarter, right? Make it easier, make it consumable, right? You don't have to, Rome was built in a day, uh, so you don't have to build your Rome in a day either. Midori, thank you so much again for your time. I really do appreciate it for all those folks. Thank you. And have a great day. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.